talented historian and writer Josephus Flavius wrote about almost 2,000 years ago. His account contains all the elements of a fantastic drama in which Jews, Romans, and idealists fight to the death. It's no wonder that Hollywood jumped at the opportunity to tell this fascinating story. With an impressive set and thousands of extras, they created a colossal film featuring the rebel leader Eleazar, son of Yair, and the Roman commander Flavius Silva in the leading roles. However, in the movie, unlike real life, no one really deals with the dilemmas or personal struggles, and certainly not with the more problematic aspects of the story. Then where should we start our story? We can start with the Hasmoneans, who were the first to discover the advantages of this isolated cliff in the heart of the desert. Or we could start at the end, with a dramatic project of the Mossad excavations, with Igal Yadin, the head of the excavation team, who would stand on the mountain and read Josephus Flavius' description of the account. And everyone around him could actually hear the echoes of the fighting. Or we could start the quest with King Herod. Herod, who ruled under the auspices of the Romans, built himself a magnificent fortress here on the mountain, which was to be a sanctuary in troubled times. And believe me, he really had troubles. Herod, like any other king, built his palaces to the highest standards of his day. One of them is this western palace. Herod's architect was probably a short guy. Here he built himself a bathhouse. And he would put his lamp here and enter his bath. What can I tell you? This king loved the good life. Until now, we spoke about Herod. It wasn't the splendor of Herod's style that made Masada what it is today. The year is 66 AD. The Jews rebel against the Roman Empire. Four years later, the temple is destroyed. Jerusalem falls. Everywhere else, the rebels were suppressed. Masada is the last stronghold where there are still Jewish rebels. And believe me, they didn't need Herod's palace. The rooms in the wall were divided and used as living quarters. They lived from food in the storerooms, and they drank water from the cisterns, kindly left behind by Herod long ago. Right from the beginning of the excavations, signs of the rebels were found elsewhere, in the palaces, in the ritual buses, and in particular in the wall. The deepest experience I went through in Masada was when they found in this particular room the first piece of scroll. To see Hebrew letters coming out of the ground, the same letters which are used until today, later more fragments of scrolls were found. One I found with my own hands, but the first experience is unforgettable. Throughout the revolt, groups of refugees sought asylum on the mountain. About 1,000 rebels gathered at this fortress in the heart of the wilderness. In 73 AD, the Romans' 10th Legion arrived with thousands of armed soldiers who deployed themselves around the mountain an enormous war machine. And the movies do it best, after the Romans, of course. The Romans built an attack ramp. The besieged rebels rolled stones down it. The Romans lift a tower to the top of the ramp, equipped with a battering ram to smash the wall. The besieged erect a wood and earthen wall to sustain the blows of the battering ram. The Romans burn it, but the wind almost burns their own tower. Then the wind veering as if by divine providence to the south blowing with full force in the opposite direction, flung flames against the wall, which now was all ablaze. And in the evening, when the wall was burnt and breached, the Roman army returned to its camps, assured that the whole affair would be over by morning. But Eleazar had ideas of his own. This is it, the last night. My friends, we've reached the climax of the drama. However, unlike the movie, here apparently the events actually took place. And here at Masada, men with families were forced to decide slavery or death. Eleazar had no doubts, but he had yet to convince his comrades in arms. Ladies and gentlemen, the speech of Eleazar. Oh, my loyal followers. The time has now come that obliges us to make that resolution true in practice. Let our wives die before they are abused, and our children before they have tasted of slavery, and preserve ourselves in freedom as an excellent funeral monument for us, as we have preferred death before slavery. 
Once Iga Yadin was asked what was the most important artifact he found on Masada. Dozens of priceless objects were found here, he answered, but if I must point to one find, it would be these Astraka. These pot shares. These may be the lots that I'm holding now. Pot shares on which the rebels wrote their names. Ten men who were chosen were the only ones who remained. Their equipment had already burned, and each of them had already killed his wife and children. Then they drew the lots. Who would kill the ninth man and fall on his own sword? And in the morning, the Romans arrived. And besides two women and a few children, everyone was dead. After the drama came silence. The silence was broken in the 5th century for nearly 200 years by a community of Byzantine monks. 1,200 years later, the first explorers came and rediscovered the mountain. Then the members of the youth movements, seeking a symbol of Jewish heroism, discovered Masada and adopted the mountain. After them came the hikers and the tourists. Masada had become a focus of pilgrimage. Professor Netzer, what do you really think about the act of courage that ended in suicide? Maybe it's the utmost courage to prefer death to a life of slavery. So it's death or freedom? Yes, death as a free man or slavery at the hands of the Romans. Which choice would you make? No matter what, Masada has become a symbol of staunch resistance against a fierce enemy. And if it is a symbol, then perhaps this might be some kind of victory. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to climb the mountain.